Hi, everyone. I'm Himali, and I am going to tell you the story of a series of multidisciplinary works from the North and South Pole. In 2017, I went to the Svalbard archipelago off the coast of Norway and the Antarctic Peninsula on a research expedition. I expected the popular imagination of a blank white landscape, but what I got was these terracotta clay mud uh, in the wake, left behind in the wake of receding glaciers. I suddenly realized that the poles weren't some distant theirs, but entangled here's. I recognized in that brown mud myself, and I saw a sense of loss. Though recently inhabited by modern scientific research stations, both of these places are uninhabited by indigenous human life. So I was wondering where the myths were, where are the legends of this place? And I realized quickly that actually there is a kind of indigenous wise elder that has preserved all of the stories of this land, and that is the ice itself. But the ice was losing its language and its stamina to tell these stories fast enough. And that became the conceit of We Are Opposite Like That, stories told from the perspective of ice and other lesser known voices. So I built this character that became a kind of medium to tell these stories. She looks like a futuristic alien wandering through this landscape, a landscape used by NASA for outer space simulation experiments. Um, she, she's wandering here in a coal mine left by the Soviets and suddenly feels a kind of friendship with its blackness. She feels uh, it, in its speculative heat, her equatorial self feels some kind of familial home. And so these climate narratives in these stories become complicated. She recognizes her complicities with fossil fuels, and here starts to emerge a kind of post-colonial character. The excerpt of the film that I will show you next tells a story of the very real Victorian obsession that the ice from the Arctic would descend into the British Empire and wipe out the empire and leave it into a frozen wasteland. The music that you'll hear is a score for string quartet, and its tempo and dynamics are coded so that you hear the temperature variances between the Victorian times and now, as well as the, all, the latitudes and the longitudes of my own journey. A clear inverted mountain floating above the horizon. For historians, the present had lost itself over time. There were no shadows, echoes of no surface. Nobody left to be beautiful. The ghost of what was to come singed.
Later on in the film, my character begins to wander through the ruins of colonialism and begins to empathize with ICE so deeply that she becomes ICE and finally disappears. This is a landscape of ghosts, specters, and spirits. Magic realism is always at play. Though it seemed unlikely, the geopoetic links between the subcontinent and the poles became clear to me as I researched them further. Uh, the Arctic gusts influenced the Indian monsoon. The subcontinent was neighboring Antarctica during Pangaea before the continental drift. Um, and now they house common microorganisms between each other. So subcontinentment came out as a kind of South Asian futurist manifesto, using the materiality of ice to posit joy despite the strife, to, uh, to uh, propose the possibility of narrative still for us, even in the South. Subcontinentment is anti-extinction. It proposes radical survival, inhabiting the architecture of loopholes. Subcontinentment looks up toward the Arctic where maybe the Vedas found home in the low sun and the early moon and maybe not. Subcontinentment looks downward toward the Antarctic with whom it shared edges and borders way back when in Pangaea. It finds common fossils, one of them an embossed ficus religiosa. It finds mica, which shimmers like something far and rare. Subcontinentment says, go there, huddle close together against the wind. Pleasure, even at the end. We are opposite like that. This is an Ica tapestry woven with the sound waves that you just heard and the history of black and brown bodies and other freaks at the poles. The almanac then kind of becomes a culmination of all these stories. It starts both ways and ends in the middle and is a messy collection of missing paraphernalia from the archives, its false philosophies, made up maps, astronomical observations, astrological readings, theories, recipes, small resistances. It uh, tells the story of an amazing colonial endeavor of British mining marble and then the permafrost evaporating and the marble turning to dust. It tells the stories of unrequited love, of how the aurora borealis might look like writing, of the, uh, the history of a Caribbean slave on the bow of the boat, the history of hybrid beings and freaks in Antarctica. It tells the story of how the own the only backup plan that the world had for an apocalypse was the seed bank in Svalbard that contains all the seeds from every nation in the world, and while I was there, it flooded. It tells the story, How to start Startle the Unbelieving tells the story of uh, how the British Empire used a 13-year-old clairvoyant girl from Calcutta to travel to the Arctic with her mind in search of Franklin and his lost men. There's only a single archive from the 1850 left of her, and this was an erasure and an attempt to give her voice. Boatness is um, another manifesto from these journeys because these are places of not knowing. These are places where the mist hangs low and the fog sets in and despite the perfect clarity of glacial water, truth is up to anybody. 
Not knowing becomes a way of being, and boatness became a way of thinking about how we might use a kind of feminine intuition as a critical method. It, um, in a way, it also thinks about how when uh, different kinds of knowledges. So how when first the chronometer fails, you look up at the stars to know directions. The stars are clouded over, so you look uh, and you listen to your kidneys. It becomes a way of accessing knowledge through different modalities. And finally, upcoming is a bird opera called An Omniscience, about uh, a bird called the Arctic Tern that flies from the Arctic to the Antarctic and back every year. It's the longest migration in, his, in the history of any species. And in its lifetime, it makes a trip to the moon and back three times, equivalent of. Um, and this opera becomes a way of thinking about wind and horizons and air and circulation, uh, a manifesto about drifting as a way of getting to our goals, um, moving with the divergences. Um, and it also makes us think about collectivity and flocking, uh, so something that we are opposite like that has depended on so many amazing musicians and dancers and historians and botanists. Um, and, uh, and then I guess upcoming is me thinking after you go to the poles, where do you go next? You go home. And home is the Himalayas after whom I'm named as well. So the first of these series is called Static Range, about a nuclear spy device that was um, planted by the CIA along with the Indian intelligence on a mountain named Nanda Devi, and the device has gone missing. It's also a series of interdisciplinary works that uh, move between ep epistolary exchanges, um, bioremedic planting, healing, um, videos, sound, tapestries, and ceramic. As Grand as What is a series of rituals in the Himalayas um, to regain the kind of center uh, of the earth chakras. And finally, there's the little pocket book of ancestors, of deities that have been left out of the Himalayan canon and still protest the same voice of ice, in some ways saying, listen, we must insist on this language. We are the language that lasts and the language that could bring us together to a different kind of future. And ins insisting on the their agency and their stories, we can say perhaps they are the thing that sustains while the new love comes. Thank you.